Good. My name is Jennifer Peterson. I work at Texas A&M in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences. And my portion of the day is a discussion on watershed systems. And so what I try and do is sort of set the foundation in terms of the basics of watersheds. And hopefully that will build on for the remaining presentations throughout the day. And certainly will give you a foundation if you hope to participate in the remaining series that will come um, in the next couple of months. So for my portion, I plan on covering these five different topics here. I'll begin first with briefly and basically what is a watershed. And um, to get us started, we're going to try and watch a quick little video clip. We're at the Chattahoochee Nature Center, and we're trying to find out what a watershed is. First victim, I need you to tell me what a watershed is. Do you have any idea? Watershed? A watershed? Where people go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So you watch it. You must buy it. Yeah. And then you shed it. I want to ask you if you knew what a watershed was. Watershed? Yeah. Is it kind of like the rain? Do you know what a watershed is? A shed that holds water. Here for a second, I want to ask you something. Do you know what a watershed is? No. No. Do you have any idea? What do you think it has something to do with? Uh. What a watershed is, yeah. That's just a drain pool, I guess you'd say. Or the drain area that water water, the rainwater drains into the river. Correct, that's a great answer. A watershed is that area of land that drains to a body of water. Be that if it's a river, a stream, the ocean, an estuary, a bay. Wherever you live drains to some water body and you live in a watershed. So everyone lives in a watershed. Okay, now I heard some chuckles. It's always better when people laugh when we play these videos. Sometimes we play this and everyone just sits there. So thank, thank you for laughing. Um, so while you did laugh, it is kind of funny that some of the answers they got from the, just the common public, but it's also kind of scary, right? I mean, a watershed is so fundamental to our everyday lives, yet very few people actually know what a watershed is and how their activities can affect the health and function of a watershed. So hopefully throughout the day, and certainly in my portion of the presentation, you'll get a better understanding of the things that you do on the land, how that ultimately impacts watersheds and water quality. So like the fishermen and the lady in the last clip said, a watershed is an area of land that water flows across, through, or under as it drains to a stream, river, lake, ocean, other body of water. The important thing is this right here, okay, that a watershed is an area of land. And it's an area of land that catches precipitation and then drains that precipitation to a neighboring body of water. And that neighboring body of water also has its very own watershed. The neat thing is we're all sitting in a watershed right now um, because all of the land area on the earth is in some way part of a watershed and all watersheds are connected across the landscape. Kind of an easy way to think of a watershed is really to think of it as one big bathtub. Now, like this diagram says, we're all in the same bathtub. Now, whether that's fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know, but if you think about it, it's pretty true. Um, you can think of a bathtub as being one big watershed by thinking of the tub itself as being the area of land that is catching that precipitation and then draining it somewhere. Uh, the tub's rim as being the boundary between any two watersheds. And then the drain of the tub as being the mouth or the outlet of a body of water, a stream, river, lake, ocean, etc. So this is a diagram showing what your typical watershed looks like. Um, your watershed boundary is typically defined by the elevational high point surrounded by a common body of water. Um, so a lot of our land in Texas happens to be flat, and I often get the question, well, how do you delineate a watershed, especially as you get down along the coast when the elevation change is so minor? But there is even minor an elevation change, so they're able to calculate that and delineate the boundary based on that elevational change. Um, in places of the state where we actually do have some elevation and some hills, it's really easy to see then how a particular land at the high elevation will catch water and drain it to a common uh, point. So all of the land then that catches precipitation and drains it to the same common point is considered to be in the same watershed. Any water falling outside of this boundary um, 
will enter into a different watershed and flow to another common point. But remember I said that all watersheds are connected across the landscape. So even though we have dozens and dozens or hundreds of watersheds, what's the commonality? Where will everything eventually drain to? The ocean, right? Everything eventually here in, in the state will ultimately end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So keep, keep that in mind. So here's a picture not taken in Texas. Unfortunately, we, we missed the 14,000 snow-capped uh, peaks. However, this is a neat diagram showing what some of those watershed divides actually look like from above, okay? So any water falling within this boundary that you see here will all eventually drain to this large river system which eventually will make its way down to the ocean. Any water outside of this boundary will flow to another common point, be in a different watershed, but again, will ultimately end up in the same place. So from this picture, it's really easy to see how all watersheds are connected across the landscape and some of the different scales that we can find these watersheds at. So for instance, each of these small creeks and drainages here, each has its own watershed that you can delineate around it that will catch precipitation drain it to that small creek, which will flow to another larger river system with an even bigger watershed, so on and so forth, until you reach the ocean. And you can look at a watershed from any one of these different scales because watersheds are nested systems, okay? They include many smaller watersheds called sub-watersheds, as well as many larger watersheds that we term sub-basin or river basin. And essentially what a basin is, is many watersheds put together. And I'll talk about basins here in a little bit. So what do watersheds look like? Obviously, if you've driven around the state at all, there's a lot of diversity in the sizes and the shapes that these watersheds will come in. They can, of course, include farmland, rangeland, small towns, big cities. They can have hills, mountains, or be nearly flat, like a lot of our watersheds are in the state. And of course, they can range in size from something that's just a few acres to, say, something as large as the Mississippi River Basin, which drains an area of about 1.2 million square miles. Okay, so we're talking about a lot of diversity. So I guess if you remember nothing else from my presentation, these three points I'm about to show, remember them. Okay, remember, watersheds are found everywhere. That's because all land area is, in par is part of a watershed. And because of that, we all live in a watershed and therefore have a direct role in the health and function of our watersheds. So we're going to shift now and talk more specifically about watersheds that we find here in Texas. Texas is a big state, right? Yes. Not a trick question. No, yes. Nod your head. Yes, Texas is huge. Okay, so because of that, we literally have thousands of sub-watersheds and watersheds, okay? So to make things a little bit easier to understand, we often lump together all of the watersheds that all eventually drain to the same large river system, like the Colorado River, the Brazos River, the Trinity River, okay? And remember, we call these collections of watersheds basins. So within the state, we have 23 major basins, 15 of which we classify as river basins, Eight, we classify as coastal basins. Can anyone take a guess as to why we call those coastal basins? On the coast, very good. Within these 23 basins are over 191,000 miles of streams and rivers, okay? So we're talking about a lot of resources, water resources uh, within our state's boundaries. So here is a map showing the 23 basins that we have here in the state, the 15 river basins and the eight uh, coastal basins. This should be very easy. Does anyone know what basin we're sitting in today? Come on, everybody. Very good. Okay, Trinity. Basin number eight. Um, let me, Blake's already shared some facts with you about the Trinity, but um, it's a pretty neat basin. It, uh, the major drainage point, obviously, for the basin is the Trinity River itself, which actually has four different forks, the Clear Fork, Elm Fork, West Fork, and East Fork. Um, the main stem of the river, as Blake mentioned, is about 520 miles, but in all, the actual classification or length of that segment is 710 miles. Um, 
I don't know where the extra 200 miles comes from, but it's north, but they say the main stem is 520 miles. Um, it is, let me pull out this other, sorry. Does anyone know what, where the Trinity Basin ranks in terms of longest rivers in the United States? If you had to guess. 50th, 50th very close. 20th, it's in between that. <laughs> yeah, the Trinity is the 37th longest river in the United States, okay? And within Texas, it's actually the seventh longest river in the state. So, um, and it is, it's the seventh longest river in the state, um, but the longest river in the state that has its entire length in the boundary. The other rivers that are longer come from somewhere else from another different state. Um, in all, the basin drains about 18,000 square miles and covers portions, as you can see, about 37 different counties. Okay, so we know what basin we're in. Those that have looked at the maps behind you, um, don't cheat. Anyone know what watershed we're sitting in today? Okay, well now you'll know. We're actually in the Catfish Creek watershed. Athens proper sits just outside, but of course the boundaries spill into the watershed boundary. Um, here you see Catfish Creek itself coming down here and flowing into the Trinity River. Some facts about your watershed. The Catfish Creek watershed stretches across two different counties, including Henderson County where we are today. In all, the watershed drains about 294 square miles. So what did I say the entire river basin drained? 18,000 18, square miles. Okay, so you get a sense of the different scales that these watersheds can be found at. In terms of population centers, uh, census estimates puts Athens at about 13,000, give or take. And of course, there are other smaller towns dotted throughout the watershed itself. Some estimates for animal numbers. This is just for Anderson County. Down here, goats, about 2,000. Cattle, about 60,000 head. Uh, sheep and lambs, about 500. Who's got cats and dogs? No one? Couple, okay. Um, we obviously have deer. I heard a couple gentlemen talking about um, all the deer they've been seeing lately. Who's got problems with feral hogs? Everybody. Everybody. I mean, their population, yeah, their population's increasing as I'm speaking. So things like that, it's, they're very difficult to quantify. Um, of course, we have armadillo, skunk, different types of waterfowl, but this should give you a sense of the different types of animals that you might expect to find in this watershed. So, so far we've been looking at just some maps, and I'd like to give us a little different view of the watershed um, from above. Let me pause that. So if I zoom out, obviously we're looking at Texas. And if you see here outlined in red, that's the Trinity Basin. So you can see just how much of the state that uh, basin covers. And you see the Trinity there outlined in blue. If we zoom into your watershed here, there's Catfish Creek watershed and then Catfish Creek coming down to meet the Trinity. So what we're gonna do, um, the, the Catfish Creek flows about 35 miles from its headwaters to its confluence with the Trinity. We're gonna, fl we're gonna fly from its headwaters down to the confluence. So um, as we're flying, I want you to do a couple of things. Try and pay attention to all of the different ways that we can use our watersheds because next I'll start talking about land use. Um, two, see if you, if you happen to live in that watershed, see if you can find where you live. Um, and then third, I'm gonna be reading some history about the Trinity Basin itself. So try and listen to me at the same time. So here we go. All right, so just uh, some basics about the, the Trinity itself. The Upper Trinity Basin has rolling topography and narrow stream channels. Soils in the region are deep to shallow clay, 
clay loam and sandy loam that support elms, sycamores, willows, oaks, junipers, mesquites, and grasses. The middle and lower Trinity Basin is gently rolling to flat terrain with wide, shallow stream channels. Clay and sandy loams predominate and support water-tolerant hardwoods, conifers, and grasses. Robert Cavalier de La Salle in 1687 called the stream the River of Canoes. The name Trinity came three years later in 1690 from Alonso de Leon who called the stream, I don't speak Spanish, I won't try, but he called the stream the Spanish phrase meaning the most holy Trinity. During the colonial period of Texas history, the land along the lower course of the Trinity was settled as far up as Anderson County. The Anuak disturbances were among the most historically significant events of the era. Settlement up the Trinity Valley continued to advance rapidly in the period of the Republic. Beginning about 1836, numerous packet boats steamed up the Trinity River, bringing groceries and dry goods and carrying down cotton, sugar, cow hides, and deer skins. Some of the packets penetrated as far as Magnolia, 10 miles west of Palestine, and in 1854, one reached Porter's Bluff, 50 miles below Dallas. Often their movements were impeded by snags or sandbars or halted by low water. Following a convention on Trinity improvement in 1849 in Huntsville, Congress in 1852 authorized a survey of the Trinity River. In the next year, an Army engineer's report mentioned the Trinity as the deepest and least obstructed river in Texas, said that seven steamboats were in operation in its lower channel, and estimated that navigation was practicable. Under a Texas Act of 1858, a bar was removed from the river's mouth, and in 1868, job boat number one reached Dallas, um, started in Galveston, reached Dallas, and it took that ship one year and four days. <laughs> in the years before 1874, nearly 50 boats continuously navigated the river as far north as Trinidad in Kaufman County and Porter's Bluff in northern Navarro County. In the peak season of 1868 to 69, boats carried 15,000 bales of cotton down the Trinity. With the construction of railroads to Dallas in the early 1870s, the river traffic began to die but high railroad rates and the prospect of Dallas as a major port kept the dream of a navigable Trinity River alive. Since that time, numerous schemes to make the Trinity navigable have been proposed. Several proposals received considerable attention and some construction was undertaken, but the dream of a port of Dallas has never been realized. Over the past century, the waters of the Trinity have become increasingly polluted. Runoff containing pesticides and herbicides and dumping of industrial and human waste, particularly in the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex, have combined to cause serious deterioration of water quality. Uh, the most severely affected area is the 250-mile-long stretch that extends from Dallas-Fort Worth to the headwaters of Lake Livingston. By the early 1960s, the river below Dallas for 100 miles was so polluted, the United States Public Health Service described it as septic. Now, fortunately, we're not in those conditions anymore. And obviously, a lot of work has been poured into helping restore and improve the quality of the Trinity River. And you guys are lucky that you've got these projects going on in your backyard that you can be a part of and help become um, part of the solution. So here we are, the Catfish Creek has met the Trinity River, and here you see the southern boundary of the Catfish Creek watershed. We're pointing south. If I zoom out, okay, keeping in mind everything that you've learned throughout the day about where everything eventually drains into, what do you think you'll see, we will see as I zoom out way off in the distance? Very good, another watershed. Where does everything eventually drain to from all the watersheds? No. The Gulf, okay. So if I zoom out, we should, off in the distance. There it is, okay. So what happens here doesn't necessarily stay here, right? Um, here it's really easy to see that what we do in this watershed and as someone uh, very cleverly pointed out, there, are wa there would be watersheds delineated all throughout the basin, right? Because as I said, things are nested, right? So what happens up here ultimately affects here, but ultimately affects everyone downstream and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico, right? So again, everything is connected and um, 
what you do on the landscape certainly affects those around you. When do we expect to see ships going down? There? <laughs> what are you about? I don't know. The, you talk about the nested systems, uh -huh. groundwater. Obviously, there's a huge. I mean, there's several aquifers. Is that and, and water flows into the aquifers? Is that just a whole different? It is a whole different. Aquifer? Yes. Um, this particular part of the state, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, pulls groundwater from the Carrizo Wilcox Aquifer. But just like surface water systems that are also, you know, that are connected across the landscape, groundwater is too. They delineate the aquifers, but it's, it's a very porous geologic material, right? Um, stratified with rocks and sand, and they, they delineate that and try and model groundwater resources. It's very difficult to do, but they obviously need to to make estimates that we're not extracting more than is being recharged into that aquifer. But it's a whole different system, but just as surface water is connected, groundwater is connected, and the two are connected too through seeps and springs. So um, that, that's a... It is. It is. And and, and lots of different aquifers underneath it. Yes. River yes. Mhm. Mm okay, so as we were flying, I had y'all pay attention to the various ways that we can use our watersheds and that's what I'm going to shift into and talk about next. From these pictures, it's easy to see that we use our watersheds for a variety of different purposes, right? We've got agriculture, crop production, recreation, drinking water, natural resource extraction, and certainly um, urban development. On a statewide basis, the majority of our land and our watersheds, about 60%, is used for agricultural purposes. This accounts for all of the grassland, pasture, and range that we have here in the state. Another 24% is in crop production. 7% is classified as forest use land. 6% is urban. Now urban includes everything from houses, apartments, hospitals, schools, everything that's been um, developed. So as Blake showed his population growth chart in his first presentation, what do you expect to happen with this percentage as the population in the state continues to rise? Double, Double right? Yeah, that's going to increase obviously at the expense of some of these other land use categories, right? If we take a closer look at land use in this particular watershed, the Catfish Creek watershed, we have the majority is pasture hay classified, and that's this yellow color that you see scattered throughout. Um, wetlands, about 21%, and that's this darker blue. The lighter blue is the open water. Uh, we also have a lot of forest green tucked in here. The major development, of course, is centered around Athens and crops. We've got less than 1% in that brown color. So that should give you a good idea of, and of course, grassland, that tan. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about watersheds, okay, but obviously water is a major component of any watershed. So we'll shift now and talk more about water and how that naturally cycles within a watershed. Okay, we call the study of water hydrology. And if you look at this picture, the common person may say, my God, 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. What's the problem? We have tons of it. Okay, but what is the problem? Salt. Salty, right? It's either in oceans or it's frozen in ice caps and glaciers, which either way, it's inaccessible to us, right? I mean, we have figured out ways to uh, desalinate water. Um, Unfortunately, it's very expensive, and we don't yet have the technology to do it on a mass scale that would be suitable you know, to provide drinking water for the millions of humans living in this country. So certainly water is a limited resource, okay? And what we have is what we're going to get. We can't manufacture water, so it's a limited resource. Less than 1% of the 75% that's on the Earth's surface is actually fresh water that's available to humans to use, okay? All of the water on the Earth is constantly cycling. Uh, we call it the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle. I'm sure most of you have heard about that. It's a very basic and fundamental concept, but it's incredibly important, okay? It truly is a cycle. It does not have a defined beginning or end, but it has some key components, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit more detail. 
Evaporation, of course, is when liquid water in our surface bodies of water, our rivers, streams, lakes, oceans, is heated by the sun and converted to water vapor, which is basically the gaseous form of water. But evaporation can also happen in trees and plants through evapotranspiration, and basically that is when liquid water on plant parts, stems and leaves, is heated by the sun and converted to water vapor. And you can kind of think of that as plants transpiring or breathing. Uh, we've got condensation then, where water vapor is returned to its original liquid state. It usually occurs when warm air rises and cools and loses its capacity to hold excess water vapor. That water vapor then condenses to form clouds. Okay, so when you see clouds, you can think condensation. But what other ways can condensation be visible outside in the environment? We actually had, had an example of that this morning. Oh. Fog, very good. When, think cold. Frost. frost, very good. Fog, frost, there's two more. Dew, dew. have you s seen the curriculum before? <laughs> yeah, fog, frost, dew, and one more, think, think light rain. Huh? I think I heard it. Mist. mist, excellent, yes. Fog, frost, dew, mist. Impress your friends with that <laughs> amazing knowledge, okay? So condensation. Clouds, fog, frost, dew, mist. Okay, last we have precipitation. Obviously, that's when condensed water and clouds becomes too heavy to remain suspended in the air. So it's gotta go somewhere, okay? Typically here it comes as rain, but certainly it could come as hail, sleet, rain, snow, depending on the physical conditions of the atmosphere at that time. So we're gonna watch a, another quick little video uh, showing the water cycle in action. Help me out. Uh, the sun's gonna rise. What's going to happen over the surface water? Yep, trees and plants. Evapotranspiration, what's forming the clouds? Condensation, Condensation great, and when condensed water is too heavy, it's going to precipitate. precipitate. All right, so as it's going to start to rain very soon, and as it's raining, I want you to pay attention to the various pathways that the precipitation can take once it actually reaches the surface of the earth. Have you guys had much rain in this area? We got some back during Noah's flood. <laughs> well, it's a lot better than where we were last year, that's for sure. Ever get any snow? Yeah? So obviously this is a movie and it's, it's you know, highly dramatized, but you know, they make it show this circular pattern. Um, but really that, that kind of is what happens um, in the natural environment. All of the processes are connected. And of course, what's happening outside, if it's temperatures are higher, you're gonna have higher rates of evaporation and, and things of that nature. But each of the components of the water cycle um, are connected to one another. And so pretty soon in the scene, the sun is gonna to start to set. Does that mean that the water cycle stops? No, okay, definitely not. The water cycle happens day and night, every single second of the day. Okay, so I had y'all pay attention to the various pathways that the precipitation can take once it reaches the surface of the earth. And obviously a lot of different factors affect which pathway the precipitation will take. But in general, just remember, it can take one of five different pathways. Okay, first we saw in the video that it can run off. Now runoff occurs uh, two ways. Obviously when the rate of precipitation exceeds the rate at which that precipitation can be absorbed into the ground. Uh, this was taken outside of College Station. A lot of times when we get rain, 
It very rarely comes as a nice, steady, soaking rain that lasts for several, several hours, right? We tend to get a heavy rainfall that comes all at once. And so that saturates the soil pretty quickly. Um, there's no more room for the water to infiltrate into, so it puddles on the surface and runs off, taking with it, remember, anything that it might encounter along its way, okay? Spilled um, oil, chemicals, paint, solvents, you know, cow manure, whatever. Um, but runoff can also occur when precipitation falls onto an impermeable or an impervious surface like a driveway, a roadway, a rooftop. Okay, is that surface porous at all? No, no. So that, run, that precipitation is gonna hit that surface, run straight off again, taking with it anything it might encounter. If you go to a gas station, okay, and just as you're filling your car and you happen to look at the ground, what do you see? a lot of spilled nasty things, okay? And I always shudder to think, man, when it rains, you know, that's gonna end up in our creeks and streams, okay? So it's no wonder we have some of the water quality problems that, that we do. Okay, second, precipitation, when it falls on the surface, it can be used by plants um, in various biological processes, such as photosynthesis. It can, of course, infiltrate through the soil profile and down to be stored in an underground aquifer, like we discussed before. Fourth, it can evaporate both as it falls from the sky and once it reaches the surface of the earth. And last but not least, it can be stored. Obviously, mostly for us, it's gonna be stored in our surface bodies of waters, our streams, lakes, and reservoirs. But keep in mind, in other parts of the world, it can be stored in ice caps and glaciers, which can store frozen water for thousands of years. So, what affects what pathway the precipitation can take once it actually reaches the surface of the earth, okay? There's a lot of different factors, but really it all comes down to these land use and land cover changes, okay? We've discussed land use, how we as humans use the land from agriculture, urban, recreation. But the point is, is when we change the way the land is used, we often change the type of land cover associated with that use, okay? For instance, if a new housing development or commercial development goes in, grasslands and forests are converted to a new land cover type, concrete and pavement. Might that impact how water naturally cycles within a watershed? Might that impact water quality and quantity? Most definitely, okay? So we're gonna finish off my section by talking more specifically about the natural functions and features of watersheds. What are they here for? What exactly do they do? So again, the magic number is five, okay? A watershed in terms of natural functions has five, five of them. Three of which we classify as hydrological and two of which we can classify as ecological. And we'll talk about each one of these in just a little bit more detail. So first, the first hydrological function is water capture, and that occurs through two processes. One is infiltration, which is the direct movement of water from the atmosphere into and through the soil surface. Percolation then is the downward movement of that water, usually by gravity, into say an underground aquifer um, for storage and for later use. A lot of different things can affect how much water is captured. Okay, obviously soil texture, depth, structure, uh, geology, topography, etc. But a big component are these pores or air spaces between individual soil particles, okay? So if it rains and water's not gonna be captured and stored in somebody's rainwater harvesting tank, or it's not gonna fall and be captured by a water body itself, um, it's most likely gonna fall on some type of surface and, and, and infiltrate down and be stored in between the pore spaces um, in the soil profile. So if I were to hold up a sandy type soil or a clay type soil, which one do you think would capture and hold water the longest? Clay. Okay, very good. And the reason is clay type soil is comprised of very small particles. They fit together very tightly. The pore spaces are pretty small. So once the water gets in there, it's gonna be held onto very tightly. A lot of energy will be required to remove water from those pore spaces. If you compare that to a sandy soil comprised of bigger and bulkier particles, they don't fit together all that well, 
little bigger pore spaces, that water is going to drain straight through. If you've ever been to the beach and you've been drinking a soda and you tip it over, what happens to that liquid? Immediately disappears, right? Conversely, if you go to a place that you know has clay soil and it's just rained, what do you typically see on, on the surface? Puddles. Puddles. If you come back several hours later, that, that puddle eventually, it will take a long time, but that puddle will um, decrease in size as that water slowly infiltrates through those smaller pore spaces and it's going to be held on to much longer than a sandier type soil. In addition to pore space, okay, obviously the amounts, the kinds, the amounts and the distribution of vegetation across the landscape will also greatly affect water capture. Of the three scenarios, which one will capture the most water? This one, right? All native vegetation, there's no impervious cover. This is going to do a great job of capturing um, as well as cleaning out any water. Say, you know, runoff is coming from the surrounding landscape that's got some pollutants. That's going to do a wonderful job of filtering those pollutants out um, as it flows through the vegetation and down through the soil profile. Um, certainly compared to a landscape like this. Now, of course, this could be overgrazing, uh, wildfire, a construction site. There is no place to filter any, any uh, runoff that might have pollutants in it. And eventually what happens here is you're going to lose a lot of your valuable topsoil. You won't be able to grow anything. That soil structure will become so compromised that the surface will literally just harden and um, be just kind of like a sheet of ice. And then it's pretty much use, useful for nothing. And obviously compared to something like this, 100% impervious cover, Somewhere down here is a storm drain. When that water hits and flows through that storm drain, where does that storm drain go to? Creeks. Your neighboring creeks and streams, right? Is that water treated at all in that process? No, but a lot of people somehow think it is, right? They don't understand that connection that if they pour their oil down the drain, you know, yeah, it disappears out of their, you know, off their property, but it's going to end up in that in your neighborhood creek and stream and cause a lot of problems. So this point is illustrated in this diagram here. In the built environment, we remove nature's ability to capture, to store, and to clean water. So the majority runs right off the surface. Very little is held onto and infiltrated um, in the soil profile. Compare that to a more natural area. Very little runs off the surface. The majority is captured and held onto for later use. Okay, so the first hydrological function, remember, was water capture. Once it's captured, it's going to be stored, okay? Surface water, of course, soil profile, and underground aquifers. Third, it's going to be released. So once it's captured, stored, eventually it will be released. It will either move underground through the soil profile or across the surface as runoff. Okay, we've talked about the hydrological functions. Let's talk about the ecological functions. Number one, watersheds provide sites for biogeochemical cycling. Big name, but really all it means is the biological, chemical, and physical transformations of nutrients that are found in air, water, and soil. A lot of the interactions are pretty complex, um, but nutrients like phosphorus, carbon, hydrogen, they're constantly undergoing transformations in their environment and it's these interactions that help maintain the microbial communities that you find along uh, water bodies in a watershed. Second, watersheds provide habitat all right, for a wide variety of plant and animal species. Every living thing has pretty specific requirements for habitat. Okay, In Texas we're lucky we have a lot of diversity in terms of soil, topography, geology, okay, and hence different types of habitat. In the western part of the state, they receive very little rainfall, um, very different geology, topography, etc. Okay, so you're going to find habitat that's, you know, plants in um, animals adapted to living in conditions that are droughty, that don't get a lot of rain, okay? In the eastern part of the state, okay, sometimes we get upwards of 60 inches of rainfall a year. That's enough to support our dense forest and, of course, um, animals adapted to living in those kinds of conditions. 
So we just talked about the natural functions of a watershed. But a watershed has several natural features okay, that help it perform those functions. It's got uplands, floodplains, riparian zones, and the water body itself. So in terms of uplands, we've kind of already talked about uplands. Remember, uplands form your watershed boundaries or your watershed divides. In this picture, we're sitting at an upland, uh, looking at, down at the common body of water that's catching everything, and then the other uplands are off in the distance. Uplands are important, okay? That upland vegetation, um, in addition to providing habitat, it's gonna help stabilize the soil surface, preventing and minimizing wind and water erosion. It's gonna help filter uh, any runoff coming from surrounding lands. And if you like to hunt and things like that, it's important recreation area, right? Second natural feature of a watershed is the floodplain, okay? And maybe a better way to envision it, um, if you've ever seen like an aerial imagery of somebody's farm and you've got the river and that vast wide floodplain coming out and that will slope up. You can kind of think of the floodplain that way um, in terms of a bigger scale as what we're showing here. But still the floodplain is very important. It's the flat area of land surrounding a water body that is subject to periodic flooding. The floodplain's main function is to um, act in a flood, play a flood mitigation role. It's gonna hold that excess flood water, slowly releasing it into the water body rather than all at once. Unfortunately though, what do we typically do with our floodplains? Pave. pave them, yeah, pave them. We'll concrete this and pave it and build our house right here or we'll engineer this creek and make it a concrete straight channel, take out its meanders and then people downstream get flooded out or this guy's house gets washed away and it's kind of, I mean, yes, I'm sympathetic, but you know, you're, you're getting in nature's way and the, the floodplain is there to perform a very specific function. So if we build in it and pave it, we're gonna change all of the dynamics within that system. Okay, third, the riparian zone. Keep in mind riparian zones and floodplains are pretty intricately linked, okay? Um, Blake talked about riparian zones a little bit, but it's the non-cultivated vegetated land that touches and immediately surrounds a body of water. If you go to a healthy stream channel that, that has some dense vegetation along its banks, a lot of native grasses and trees, that's what that riparian area is, okay? Riparian areas can include wetlands. We have a lot of wetlands here in this particular watershed. Riparian zones and wetlands can work together to help stabilize slopes and stream banks, filter pollutants so they don't end up in the water body itself, maintain proper water temperatures by providing shading along the shoreline, supplement nutrients to things living in the water body itself, provide habitat for a wide variety of plant and animal species, and again, uh, perform that flood mitigation function. So from here, some key points to remember from my section, obviously what a watershed is, remember it's an area of land that catches precipitation and then drains that precipitation to a neighboring body of water. Where do we find watersheds? Everywhere. Very good, we find them everywhere. We use them for many different purposes. They are a critical component of the water cycle. Remember, they have both hydrological and ecological functions and many natural features that help them perform those functions.